cheers to another episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. I'm your guide, AJ Weinzettel, on this journey of stories showcasing the people behind the wonderful world of wine, where we dive into conversations ranging from terroir, viticulture, to favorite music, superpowers, and more. Please enjoy this episode of the Wine Notes Podcast. Jim, thank you so much for taking time to be on the podcast today. I really appreciate it. That's wonderful to be here with you. Uh, the last time I saw you, it was opening weekend for Domain Willamette, yeah. and holy cow, you're running around like a madman. I mean, in a very happy way, mm-hmm. and uh, you know, I was exploring the the property a little bit, and you know, there's a little house there, and I was just kind of walking up, and there you were, just kind of relaxing on the couch. I'm like, oof, sorry, because that was that was a crazy weekend for you. I'm sure that's great. You know, the um, my wife spent six years planning that, designing it, uh, getting it permitted, and building it. Wow. Six years. That is, uh, and has to feel like such a great accomplishment. It's a gorgeous facility. Yeah. 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 She's, she, um, she really put her all into it. You know, um, uh, AJ, she said uh, to me, she said, uh, you know, honey, when I complete this and get this construction finished, mm-hmm. I'm handing you the keys and quitting. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I can't blame her. That's a and, huge thing. Yeah, yeah. She's she she hasn't done that yet, but um, she put her all into it. I know, have no and, doubt. And, and, and also think about managing it during the the pandemic, right? Uh, where you know what was originally um, prescribed and um, spec'd uh, couldn't be found, couldn't be sourced. It was on a it was in a container somewhere in Shanghai, <laughs> and yeah. we couldn't get it. Oh, so she she went through, you know, a number of those changes. It was it was challenging, to, to say the least. Yeah. I'm glad that it's that it opened and it's been a great success. Yeah, the you know the it's really just part of the Oregon story. It's 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 just a little part of the Oregon story. There are a number of remarkable sparkling wine producers in Oregon. Yes, and and really we have the um, uh, really the the privilege to work with Andrew Davis, mm-hmm. who who saw a need to teach others how to make great sparkling wine. We would not have been able to do what we did without Andrew Davis. Yeah, uh, so he's an integral part of what we're doing, and that and it has enabled Oregon winemakers like ourselves to kind of leap ahead in terms of uh, knowledge and experience because of him. So it's, um, he's done a great service for Oregon. I, I couldn't agree more. Uh, before we get too deep, do you mind if I pour us a little bit of a blind wine? Oh, absolutely. Okay, yeah. great. Yeah, we need, uh, we need something. Here. A little something. Yeah. Uh, like I said before we started taping, um, you know, you can say it's yummy, you can say it's yucky, whatever you want to say, there is zero pressure. Uh, I always try to find some sort of connection with the wine in the glass to you. And, you know, sometimes I do an okay job. Sometimes I'm spot on. Uh, I wouldn't say I'm spot on, but I, I, I think I have a pretty darn good connection here. You know, I was thinking about, because I heard this is what you do. Yes. I read it in the notes last night. And I'm thinking, okay, so what does Justin King put AJ up to? What has he done? <laughs> <laughs> um, nope. You know, Justin and Ed just got recognized by Wine Enthusiast magazine. Oh, very as nice. the number one uh, Best Buy Pinot Noir. Actually, but wine. Okay. Uh, uh, and um, through with their uh, inscription, Pinot Noir. I was not aware of that. I, I try to keep up with everything, but there's just... I mean, it was big, big news, and I'm very proud of them. Yeah, no, that that is awesome. I will say Justin had nothing in this whatsoever. This was mm-hmm. this was all me. Mm. Well, I like the wine. Mm-hmm. It's a. It's pretty. Yeah, no, it's it's a great wine. It's got great mid palate. Yeah, lots of fruit and a nice, you know, kind of a. It's got that wonderful, um, you know, cutting edge to help you with your food. Yeah, yeah. No, it's uh, it 
to me, it's a very special little wine. Uh, the vineyard that it came from, I adore. Mm-hmm. The winemaker, I adore. It's it's a pretty special little wine for myself, and glad it's a good connection for you. Yes, yeah, and to be able to share it. A yin and a yang. It's got a that blade of acidity mm-hmm. um, that follows its fruit. So, yeah. 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 Do you have any more of this? Uh, I, I do, <laughs> and, and and at the end of it, I'll, I'll at the end of the interview, I will reveal what it is. Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't grown in the Willamette Valley. It should be. <laughs> I guarantee it's the Willamette Valley. Wonderful. Yes. Yes. Um, you have quite the history, and there's so much to dive into. And you know, I always try to do as much research as I can. But I came across a blog article uh, July 1st, 2016. Of all the wineries I deal with, there is none that, um, that are more proactive than Willamette Valley Vineyards. I cannot believe the mailings and support I get from them even at the shows such as the Nantucket Wine Festival. They are the friendliest and most forward-thinking of all representatives. It seems as if Willamette Valley Vineyards is an upbeat organization, and, it's pro- and, it's, and it is probably because the employees are invested quite literally in the winery. This is a vineyard to keep your eye on. They are going places. That's very nice. You know, that is a, you could say that about our industry. Um, the, you know, we're just a reflection of, of a DNA that exists in, amongst Oregon winemakers, particularly in the, in the Willamette. Um, you know, our industry, um, I think, sets itself apart. Uh, and I, I found this out, really, I didn't know better until I went to Burgundy to spend time. Mm-hmm. We're going, yeah, yeah. And, um, and there, they just, they, they regretted um, the lack of cooperation that they saw here. Right. And they longed for it. And, and actually, you see that in, when you go out and present at wine dinners throughout the nation, uh, people marvel at Oregon winemakers. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why I think the industry has grown so effectively um, over the last 50 years is because we learn from each other. And so there's a a disposition and an instinct um, to share and to help. Right. Um, And as I was explaining to you about uh, Lynn Penner-Ash, you know, really explaining in great detail how she got you know, optimum results in how she managed her small bin fermentations Mm -hmm. and openly shared that with all of us. Um, So, you know, it's, you know, fail fast and learn. Right. And 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 everybody. That's what's happened. Yeah. 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 And so the, and I think if you think about, you know, your, your career and you're part of it too. I mean, you are gathering these stories and you're projecting these stories where otherwise they would not be told. And you're able then to um, make sure that the public understands what's going on here. And, and I think people are drawn to it. Um, they want that in their own lives. You know, there, there's an awful lot of doggy dog in this world. Right. And uh, people really do long for um, cooperation, uh, cohesion. Um, respectful, kind conduct, collaboration, right. consensus. Um, you know, the, the, one of the people in our industry that is probably better, I've seen better than anywhere else, is uh, David Adelsheim. David Adelsheim will make unbelievable personal sacrifices of his time and his energy to find, to try and find a consensus. And that's not easy to do. The Oregon winemakers, uh, you know, Carl Downauer, you remember, uh, um, pardon me, Cole, Cole Downauer, mm-hmm. um, who is now passed. Uh, Cole, when he wrote about Tewa in Oregon, he said in the Willamette, there is another component to it, and that's its people. It's part of our Tewa. It's it, our people. It very much is. And, you know, with 
uh, trying to figure out the next chapter of IP and C. Yeah. You know, David is like still knee deep into that yeah. and trying to help, you know, figure out that next chapter. Yeah. And all these stories, to me, it allows the consumer to be a superstar at the t dinner table at Thanksgiving, right? Because they fall in love with the stories and then they say, I have this bottle and you know, just tell the story of the bottle and everybody around them is just in awe and just like, oh, this wine is so good. And it's, that's contagious. I bet it is. Yeah, so um, that quote, I think, is a reflection of a, um, you know, intentional, intentionality on the part of the industry that does set it apart. And so you look at, like, um, one of the, I think, probably biggest moments in most winemakers' lives is to attend Steamboat. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I have had the benefit of getting to, got to know the organizers of Steamboat, you know, years ago. Right. Stephen Carey and others, uh, who's now passed. Um, but I have never had an experience like that. You know, going there, um, sitting in that, you know, library, um, you know, around, you know, these six and eight person rounds, um, tasting blind the wines that each winemaker brought. Right. And then our table captains standing up and crucifying these wines. <laughs> right. And then the winemaker, um, you know, the wine's revealed and the winemaker then must stand up and explain the wine. And, but the directions were to bring wines that you are not showing off. You brought wines that you wanted help with. Right. And so that was expected. But um, there, there were some very frank comments made and some really um, uh, revealing uh, insight because the winemakers would then amongst themselves try and ferret out what really the solution should be. Mm -hmm. And to see that exchange, I mean, what, what group of people, what industry does this? It doesn't. And I, you know, there, there is talk of trying to bring Steamboat back yeah. and, you know, try to help bring, you know, more of an international community and bring that feeling and education, all, all of that back. And I, I hope it, I hope it happens. Well, I think it's probably one of the biggest reasons why our industry has um, improved so rapidly. I couldn't agree more. Yeah. I mean, that education and helping each other out is, is huge. Yeah. Yeah, and then of course, it, 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 you know, at the end of the day, we're all wearing our napkins on our heads, right? <laughs> um, so it's uh, a lot of fellowship as well. Yeah, yeah. Uh, diving into a, another story, um, Dick and Betty O'Brien from the Elton Vineyard. You know, the, the story behind... Um, Dick and Betty going over to Germany, staying with people who, uh, you know, had a Riesling vineyard, mm -hmm. and then they came back and they're like, "Oh, we need to uh, to plant a vineyard." Uh, Betty got her uh, sent her dad to Napa to look at the agriculture and look at, you know, the respect of the land and all of that. And then you know, he granted her like, "Hey, you know, you can plant, you know, I don't know, it was like five or eight acres." Mm -hmm. And you seem to know Betty before all that. I'm curious, how did you know Betty and how, how did it come about that um, you got fruit immediately when she, when she, you know, when it was planted well, and you ready know, to go? Well, you know, the first time I met Betty was when I was a graduate student at Willamette Atkinson School. And she, um, I think I met her in the uh, Earl Luttrell's accounting class. Um, this is in 1978, and um, Earl Trell liked wine, and of course we were aspiring students, so we quickly organized a wine tasting group that included Earl <laughs> and his wife. Right. Um, and uh, actually, his um, Earl son-in-law here works here, Paul, and his daughter. He's had his Earl's two daughters have actually worked here. Earl Trell, my accounting professor at Willamette was on my first founding board of directors. When I was after student there, we'd go to um, 
it's a long-winded way of answering this story. Oh, no, no, it's great. I love it. Um, Earl and um, Steve Archer, um, who was the dean of the school and the, uh, taught economics, and Mazur, who taught um, organizational behavior, and uh, a fellow named Gates, who taught statistics, or tortured us with statistics, actually, <laughs> Bruce Gates, we would meet um, at the dairy lunch in Court Street in Salem, right. Wednesdays at 7 in the morning, uh, where we began to plan Willamette Valley Vineyards use it, pulling the napkins out of the dispenser and making notes on the napkins. Back of the napkins, yeah. perfect. And that is where Willamette Valley Vineyards started. And so, um, and so Betty, you know, has a very deep involvement with the, this idea. Um, we would go on Thursday nights. Um, we would go to uh, in West Salem, not far. You know, she lived in out West Salem. Right. So um, we would go to a, on Thursday nights. We go to a bar there, and our professors would meet us there. Which was very much like uh, what when I went to school in England. Very much the same kind of behavior. Mm -hmm. You don't see, often see that in, in no. schools. No, schools. no, no, no. And we would really enjoy each other's company around a couple of beers, and um, even play some pool. And so it was in those times where we got a chance to really talk about what, what was possible in Oregon. Right. And uh, so my friendship with. Dick and Betty goes back to when I, well, Betty introduced me to her husband. I went out and spent time at their place, and I remember going up to one of the beautiful, I don't know if you've been to some of these sites on their property, but, uh, but they took me up to a site uh, that was north of their vineyard up on a knoll. And I said, Betty, Dick, I said, why didn't you build your house here? You can see you know, all the way up to Ribbon Ridge, the Shahila Mountains, the Dundee oh, Hills, right. you know, Mount St. Helens, you know, Mount Hood, Mount Jefferson, you know, a couple of the sisters. Right. I mean, it's a stunning view. And uh, Dick, you know, he was raised in, you know, Kansas. He, he, didn't, he, was, he didn't want to be up on, in the wind. He wanted, to be, <laughs> he wanted to be down amongst the trees. Right, right. Uh, so that's the explanation. I said, you know, I said, Betty and Dick, I said, Someday I'd like to build a house here. Well, that was their parents' property at the time. Mm -hmm. And 20, over 25 years later, um, Dick and Betty helped me buy that land out of the estate. Wow. And I've left a footprint for a house on that hill. Now, it may be you know, somebody else's child who will live there, but at least I got it started. That's awesome. And, and so Betty... Um, we would have our, we would, every month we would meet with a tasting group in different homes, right? We'd move around to different homes. And um, so their interest in wine got stronger and stronger, as did mine. Mm -hmm. And so they planted, their first year they planted 1983, which is the same year we planted here. Right. And we belong to a um, really small group that still exists today. It's the longest lived wine organization in Oregon and it's the Salem Growers and we started by meeting in a deli actually in South off of South uh, Liberty I think right and um, and then now they meet at McNary it's still going on and Don Byard was one of the organizers of this event right and he worked at the Department of Transportation but that's when I that's where I got to spend more time with Dick and Betty was at these uh, grower meetings. That's amazing. And and the Castiles were the they were the they were the the experts. They the Castiles really studied, and of course their academic backgrounds made them perfect for doing this. Right. They helped all of us um, by their uh, you know real um, technical expertise in helping us at these Salem Brewer meetings. So that's how the, the relationship developed that, over time. That's amazing. Betty, Betty um, became a member of our board of directors at Willamette Valley Vineyards. And I was very involved in the Oregon Wine Advisory Board. And we had lost our executive director, so I called Betty up. I think at the time she was 
I think she was working for PERS at the time in charge of um, communications, I think. And um, I said, Betty, I said, you know, we need a executive director in a hurry. We just lost our executive director for the Oregon Wine Advisory Board. Right. And she said, well, yeah, I'll only do it on an interim basis, only just <laughs> for a short period of time. Of course. So um, Betty agreed to be our executive director for the Oregon Wine Advisory Board, and she ended up serving there taking us all the way up to the new creation of the Oregon Wine Board. Wow. So she played, Betty O'Brien played um, one of the keystone roles in the organization of our industry. That is amazing. That is something I was not aware of. You know, so the, I was a, I got to get their fruit in the early years and they did wisely. They uh, provided fruit to other, grow, other winemakers. Mm -hmm. And these winemakers ended up making very highly rated wines from their vineyard. Right. And so their fruit got pretty expensive. So I wasn't buying as much as I used to, right? And then um, the, um, the, I remember I was in my office. I had an office down in the cellar. I remember Dick coming in during harvest and he was all just beet red. He was really, really, um, uh, exercised and Dick said Jim I said he said this has got to be my last harvest uh, this is too much having to deal with all the different requirements of all these other winemakers some of these winemakers wanting him to pick in these small little yellow trays right right and this was too much for Dick stacking on his on his farm truck right and um he says, Jim, I says, oh, we got it. I says, yeah, I'm going I'm to have to put the vineyard up for lease. We, we then c competed for that mm -hmm. and were successful in getting the rights to lease that vineyard. That's amazing. And, um, and now, um, um, well, while Dick was still alive, Dick and Betty came to us and came to me and said, Jim, you negotiated a lease that will last longer than we will. So we want you to buy the vineyard out of our estate. And it has to be at the market price. Mm -hmm. Then this is what they said to me. They said, now, once you get the determined the true market value, we want you to buy half of that value will go to Oregon State University's extension in viticultural program and the other half to Chemeketa's wine program. Now you think about this. I got goosebumps right now. You think about, because I, I, I knew what they did, right? Dick was a middle school teacher. Right. And Betty was started, when she started planting those grapes, she was the executive director of the Sandy M Girl Scouts. These people didn't have any money. They, they were on their dad's farm. And they worked every summer, every weekend, their whole lives to build one of Oregon's most remarkable vineyards. Mm. And in their passing, are giving it all back to higher education. Isn't that amazing? That is absolutely amazing. You know, and not, not a better story. And, and like I said, I love the vineyard. Yeah. It is, it is a true little treasure. Well, you know, when I won the lease on this, um, I should have done my homework um, a little better than I did. It's because, okay. Because the, what happened was um, they were, of course, contracted with other winemakers. Mm -hmm. Well, they were contracted with, uh, with Ken Wright uh, for a number of years. Right. And so I, I had to farm for Ken Wright. <laughs> 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 now, he had just a block, mind you. Right. Um, but he had a really good one. Right. And it was right on, um, I, when you go there, you'll see, if you look carefully at how the, the land lays against, you know, the Ola Hills, you can see how the, when the ground's worked up, how the color of the soil changes. So it's really red, you know, as you go up in elevation. Right. And as you come down, it turns brown. Well, Ken had contracted for the block right on the bathtub ring 
of the Great Missoula Lake flood. Oh my goodness. So he had the sedimentary soil on top. Right. And he had the deep jury soil below. Oh my goodness. Vines on their own roots from art. Mm. And um, he, he made um, just world-class Pinot Noir from that vineyard. I have no doubt. Yeah. yeah. So, but I and so, but the advantage I had was learning because when you're growing for a great winemaker like Kent Wright, you learn. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, and so that was, and so we still intentionally do um, grow for top Oregon winemakers uh, in small yeah. lots. Yep. Yeah, yeah. At our vineyards. Yes, and I I highly seek them out. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That. Um, you know, you, uh, you, you'll probably know about the relationship the Hermans have with uh, El Tualatin, for example. Correct, yeah. And, you know, they're making, they look at the ratings on those lines. It's, it's crazy. I mean, 96 plus easy. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that something? That is something. You know, I first met him, um, at, you know, he was an attorney for the industry. Yeah. He was an expert in, you know, basically alcohol law. Right. And just look what he's done with his life. It is amazing. And again, that's why I, I love sitting down and seeing all these different stories and learning and then just passing them, passing them along. It, mm -hmm. it is absolutely amazing. Yeah. Well, I could go, I could go on and on. I could just talk nonstop. So well, that, that's fine. I, <laughs> uh, I haven't seen this personally, but I've heard that there's like bottles of Willamette Valley vineyards in episodes of Friends. Oh my God. Yes. How did that happen? Um, Oh my, I gotta make sure I remember this. You know, it's, I'm 71 now, and there's been a lot of wine between then and now. I understand. I mean, and if it's um, no, well, here's, no what, pressure. here's what happened. Um, the, um, God, you know, we had, um, and we still have, an ambassador program here at the winery. And an ambassador program is where we have young, you know, kind of aspiring uh, wine industry. Um, people who are who want to learn about wine and want to sell wine. right and so one of the uh, employees that came that was working here what we did was when we first started we were trying to figure out how to sell wine of course so what we did was we did in our case we did wine tastings in our shareholders homes and he went to uh, cottage grove uh, to do this wine tasting and um they had invited, you know, their neighbors and their, they even had some relatives there. Right. And uh, at this tasting, uh, he met the chef to the actors of Friends. Wow. And she was the set chef. Right. And um, so she, she fell in love with the wine. She was buying the wine from him. Of course, he was an ambassador. That was his job. Right. Sell the wine, ship it to California. Right. Well, she was buying the wine. She was serving it with the, you know, with her meals that she prepared for the actors. And this went on for a period of time. And um, I finally, I got a call from her. Um, it was a little bit of an office scuttlebutt. We knew a little bit about this kind of fun thing that was going on. Courtney Cox really loved our Pinot Gris, so we got to hear all about that. <laughs> and um, she called me uh, one time. She says, now, if I could put your wine on the set, would you be willing to send me some of the wine as samples? And I said, well, of course. And right. I was thinking, you know, why didn't we think of this? <laughs> but um, so we started sending her cases of wine. And she would call me up and say, okay, now watch this next week's airing. Right. And see if you can spot your wine. Now we sent her to Alton Estate, we sent her Griffin Creek, and we sent her Willamette Valley wine brands. Right. And sure enough, you watch those shows really carefully. You could see like on a back bar or maybe in the back kitchen by the toaster or, or uh, you know, you'd see, and so I, I called her up and said, well, this is going, this is awesome. Right. Um, and so it got to be kind of a fun thing. So we, what we did was we alerted all of our um, distributors and distributor sales reps. Um, and we said, look for this wine. So we started a contest. 
and it was it was covered by uh, you know NBC who cut, who you know showed the the, the series, <laughs> and so they came down and they watched us watch their show, right? And they filmed us watching their show uh, for the news, and us seeing if we could spot the bottle. Oh. And we so we started basically a contest, a national contest, if you could spot the bottle on the in the set. Well, what happened was the actors really got into this. So they started, um, you know how most of the time, you know, most producers won't really, unless you're paying for a product placement, you know, you're, you have a hard time figuring out what is that. Right, exactly. Well, the actors got into it. They put that label front and center. So they would sometimes grab the bottles on the, during the <laughs> filming and drink the wine where they were sitting, sitting and they turned the label right into the lens of the camera. Oh. Oh my gosh! So that was it. Was just fun. That is fun. And um, and so then um, uh, they, we got invited to go to the 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 party that they have, you know, at the end of the right the end of the wow. series. And I sent down. I didn't go because um, I knew how these things went. Because they don't stop filming until quite late in the evening. So the parties don't start till like around one thirty or two in the oh. morning. So that. So I sent one of our young people who was about their age down, and um, they sent us back one of our Pinot Noir, which they loved our Founders Reserve Pinot Noir. They sent us back a Founders Reserve Pinot Noir bottle, and all the actors had signed the bottle. Oh my gosh, where is that bottle at now? Well, we had it in our display case here at the winery. Right. And uh, at one big evening re um, reception, that bottle went missing. Oh. Yeah, that's heartbreaking. So, so the story got back that that's what happened. Right. So the chef ended up go after the show was was canceled. Uh, the show Joey started up, and so she was the chef for that show. Mm -hmm. So they did the same, and we still have that bottle. That's good. I'm glad you did that. <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> and so you could spot our bottles on Joey as well. That's so amazing. that was a lot of fun. That is fun. That is fun. Um, you know, there is a show that you've referenced a few different times, um, The French Paradox, uh, you know, by 60 Minutes, and yeah. how that kind of uh, took wine cells and elevated them up, and... It changed everything. It did. And I'm looking at that, and then I'm looking at, like, you know, our the, the current campaign that's out there, you know, for this month has come over October. Yeah. And it is to kind of like, hey, this wine is still good, even, or wine is good, wine, you know, is communal, even though there's like sober October. You know, when you compare and contrast both of those and then different times that we're in, I look at it personally as, I didn't come into wine until like my, early 30s and really really didn't get really deep into it until even later and I appreciate the come over October I love the French paradox I don't know I, I don't know what I'm trying to say here but I'm like wine has been around forever and I feel that there is so much fear in the world of wine and I'm really curious, is that fear real? Because we're, we're trying to get this younger generation, but like, is it real? I mean, I, I don't know. I, I don't feel like people in their 20s would actually like drink a bunch of wine. It, well, exactly. I mean, AJ, you have the experience that most people do. Um, I think there's a number of things that are happening all at once. The first thing that's, that's happening is um, the what happened during the pandemic? Right. People were at home. Um, they they um, really loaded up their pantries. Of course, yeah. Um, and and frankly, some people did drink more than they would normally drink. I did. Yeah. Yes. And um, and and maybe more than than is advised. The the other thing that happened during the pandemic is that people started exploring wines and they explored cooking. You know, they there was a lot of activity around cooking and wine. Yes. Now, and a lot of learning that hasn't gone away. No. Right. Those are the same people 
that are consuming today. Right. Um, some of them still have pantries that are pretty stocked. Mm -hmm. The um, so so I think part of what's happening, especially for women, is um, a little bit of a kind of a reset following the pandemic. That's fair. And absolutely, it is. Right. They're, they're looking at this, thinking, you know, I you know I need to um, put put this in perspective and create a balance with where wine or al alcohol right. it, you know, is in my life. That's a healthy and positive thing. Of course. For the last, what, 50 years or more, people have been drinking less, but drinking better. That's certainly true even from the turn of the century when the consumption of alcohol was much, much higher than it is today. Right, well, even if you took, when I was growing up, right, Dunkin' Donuts was like the coffee that you'd get for like 75 cents. Right, and now we're drinking better, and we'll spend seven dollars and fifty cents on a cup of coffee. That's exactly. Well, the same mega trend is occurring. The um, there have always been these elements in our society that um, are um, that don't have a positive view of, of alcohol or forms of alcohol, and they're 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 gaining a voice now. The, the other thing that's, that's happening is um, the, the cost of everything that's rising, including the cost of providing services to the public. Mm -hmm. And alcohol has always been a fairly easy product to tax. So if you can demonize it more, you can, might be able to get more tax dollars from it. So there's a real powerful incentive that's occurring. Mm -hmm. And that's what you see here in Oregon. The Oregon Health Authority um, clearly has been demonstrated, even by our major news organizations, is lacking integrity in what they're telling lawmakers. And we all know that. They, they've hidden their own research from lawmakers, and that's been discovered. Right. Uh, so they're obviously highly motivated by figuring out how to get more money in the coffers of their organization to serve their purposes. Well intended, right. but nevertheless, it's still a powerful motivator. So there's a lot of forces at work. The and we're gonna just write we're gonna have to write it out. And I think what's happening, you know, it was I think what is it, Karen McNeil, right, that said, yep. um, hey, this isn't about alcohol. This is about um, having something in which we can enjoy our friendships with. Right. That um, you know, wine is a is an important part of a healthy lifestyle. The if you are lonely and sad and depressed um, and alcohol free, you won't live as long as someone who has a wonderful bottle of wine that they share with their friends on weekends. Exactly. The people's uh, you know life expectancy and the amount that they enjoy their life has a lot more to do with um, all the other factors of association with each other. Right. And wine, and really good wine, is that, is that medium that starts a conversation um, or allows a conversation to focus on things that people might find in common. I know that if you live down the street, I know what we'd be doing. <laughs> And I'd be learning a lot from you about all the different wines that you've enjoyed. Right. And I would be learning a ton from yeah. you as well. Yeah. And just sharing the stories. And like what I was saying earlier about bringing that bottle to dinner or to Thanksgiving and to be able to share those stories. It's all about that community. And so the Come Over October will be, is made possible by the information you're providing people. Because it's not just the wine that they're, that, you know, and, and the hors d'oeuvres, right? And talking about, you know you know, what, what the neighbors are doing. It's, um, it's also about the aspirational stories behind these wines mm -hmm. uh, and the families yeah. and the, the unbelievable sacrifice and passion and joy that is involved in producing these wines. 
Exactly. Like when when I was setting up, he brought in some grapes from the vineyard, and he's like, you know, taste, you know, the different clones, and like, there's excitement, there's joy, there is education, there is, there's so much there. Yeah. Oh, it is absolutely phenomenal. I yeah. Love so, it. so you're, you, I think you're, you're exactly right. It's, um, you know, it, it, what's humorous, AJ, if you go and look at um, the Silicon Valley Bank does a report each year. Correct. Well, I've saved them all, and I'm a boomer, <laughs> so I printed them out. <laughs> and and I've got these files of all these Silicon Valley Bank studies each year, and I'm telling you, you'd be a manic depressive, you know, if uh, if you really took every one of those things, you know, at face value, because only what five years later they're saying we're off to the races. Five <laughs> years later, you know, the house is burning down. Right. Really. Right. <laughs> I, I'm right there with you. I'm right there with you. You know, I had an opportunity uh, years and years ago to travel to the Holy Land. And I got to go to the, the little town of Nazareth. And in the excavations they were doing there for a hospital, they discovered a very large um, winemaking enterprise carved into the rock that must have been a village activity. It was so large. Wow. Uh, so, you know, the, the, you know, where they did the stomping, you know, mm -hmm. where they pressed out the juice was carved into the rock. It must have taken an enormous effort over a long period of time to do this. And how they then would then have the juice drained down into the next vessel. Right. And then um, this, this is something that happened well over 2,000 years ago. Uh, so... Um, I, you know, I, I remember the, the thing, the memory I have best, though, of our, um, the longevity of what we've committed our lives to is best, I think, in, in, uh, in the movie uh, Star Trek, where in Captain James Kirk's um, room in his suite there at the, inside the uh, ship, there's a Bordeaux bottle sitting on the table uh, that has a cork at the top of the bottle. Right. And um, I'm thinking that whoever did that set, that w there was some intentionality there. there it, I couldn't agree more. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, that is amazing. Yeah. Oh, um, intentionality. You were at um, a 30 year celebration of a good friend of yours, Joe Dobbs, at the Irving Street Kitchen in downtown Portland. And in that uh, speech that you gave for Joe, you said, my biggest regret is not being able to grow Willamette Valley Vineyards fast enough to keep, to keep Joe. Uh, I hold out hope that one day we will make wine together again. And I asked Joe the same question I'm getting ready to ask you. Is there any plans in the future for the two of you to make some sort of wine together? You know, it, the process is already underway. Um, we have um, um, we have a brand that we we really acquired from you know a hard story in the wine industry where Pam lost her husband um, of Willful mm -hmm. uh, prior to the time she started Willful. So they had a brand with her husband called Daedalus. And, mm -hmm. and after they had separated, um, he passed. Um, and, in, and we were providing the fruit for that brand of, um, uh, it was Gruner, Gruner Veltliner there at Elton. Okay. And um, so the way we settled our uh, affairs up was to take the brand for the, um, Pam offered the brand for the balance that was owed on the grapes. Mm. She had no need for it anymore. Right. And we thought, well, maybe there's a way of honoring that story. Um, and so we're, the first wine that will appear under the Daedalus label will be a wine that Joe Dobbs has made. Wow. Um, it's about, it's not a big lot, it's about maybe 260 cases of a Pinot Noir Right. from his estate um, that will re likely release maybe in a year. 
wow, it'll take a while to do this. But right. what this enables us to do is to you know kind of pull him back underneath the tent because part of the deal was this Joe, you've got to go out and tell the story of this line with us. He's an amazing storyteller. Yeah. So um, he's committed to um, presenting this line with us at dinners to tell the story of the Daedalus brand. So the Daedalus brand, the Daedalus you know, has a, an important meaning. Um, you know, Daedalus is the, the great you know, craftsman. The, the, um, and, and so the brand is really dedicated to the men and women uh, winemakers of Willamette, past and present. Mm -hmm. And um, it, it's, it's a way that we get to come back together again. Wow. It's kind of like, uh, um, you know, getting the, the gang back together. Yeah, that's amazing. I can't wait for that. That, that, will, be, that will be spectacular. You know, I, I, um, you know, I think I told you that Joe, when Dean Cox passed away in his sleep during harvest, Saturday night, it was only the next day that news got out. And um, Joe called me and said, Jim, can I help? And so Joe came, even though he was involved in his own harvest in mm -hmm. Silver Ridge, he came to help us get through the harvest. And then later the next year, July 1, 1996, he joined us as head winemaker. And he left us in um, in the 2000, year 2002, about around, around close to the same time mm -hmm. in, in the year. And he, but he told me, he said, I want to go start my own business. And, um, and he had already begin, begun to um, advise other uh, brands and other wineries how to improve their wines. And so, but he needed a place to start. So I said, well, why don't you use Tualatin, Bill Fuller's winery? Bill was at that time a partner with us and right. we weren't using the winery. So Joe started his business in his winery at Tualatin. That's amazing. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, you know, he's, he's a remarkable entrepreneur and um, it, you know, I really wasn't growing the business fast enough for him. That's how I lost him. But um, but he really needed to go out and and build. Right. He, he, he needed to he needed figure out to spread his wings yeah. and like get yeah. that on. And he and he did. Yeah. He did. And I'm really glad that he's been. He's now back focused on what his greatest talent is. I believe he's a prodigy in winemaking. And I've seen him and seen him do that here. Uh, so yeah, now this is my other one here. Yeah, no, you opened that right before we were filming, and uh, you know it just instantly brought back memories of sitting with Joe in his house, you know, tasting through those wines. Uh, yeah. It was right after harvest. You know, there was a bunch of stink bugs all around, and uh, mm -hmm. just an amazing down-to-earth fellow. Just yeah. open conversation about anything and everything. He's he's quite something, and uh, you know I, we, I in, the, in the first our first years here at the winery before he joined us, we got fruit from his dad at Markham Hill right. Vineyards, and um, so I knew his dad before, he, and I remembered the stories about how he taught his son Joe making making wine in plastic garbage cans. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it started. I don't doubt it. I don't doubt it. Uh, I have a little bit of a selfish question for you. Um, so this year, I... Uh, well, let me back up a little bit. So I've been in the tech industry since 1993. I've been deep into the world of wine you know, for like the past five years. And in those past five years... I have seen, you know, a growth in the Oregon wine community just I'll, I'll, in terms of presenting a better front and um, in that, you know, wineries are starting to do more reservations. 
And I noticed, you know, there's a company out there that has kind of dominated the market. Looking at the software myself from a software perspective, I'm like, it's overly complicated and it's overly expensive. So this year I launched my own reservation system and I'm just curious, you know, with just the teeny bit of information I've given you and the amount of time that you've been in the wine industry, do you have any advice that you might? Oh, for God, help us. Oh my God, this talk thing. I was trying not to say the name. Yeah. Oh, let me tell you. Um, we got issues. You know, the, our business is most successful when we understand our customers mm -hmm. and what their specific interests are. Um, and we are, unfortunately, we, there is a software that we use called uh, WineDirect that, right. that is a good contact management system if you can navigate it effectively, if a person can you know, serve a customer and navigate it, which is difficult to do because it's, it's clunky, it takes time. Customers don't like waiting. Right. Um, now, WineDirect is trying to improve, and we're into hospitality, so we're, we're having to send a food order back to the kitchen, and it has to go to multiple locations, whereas WineDirect doesn't do that. Uh, so we've had to go to use a software called Square, Mm -hmm. which is awful. Now, the staff knows how to use it because it's simple. Right. But it doesn't ca capture um, contact information and, or in a way in which you can go back and, and learn, what your your, learn who the customers were or what they liked. Right. Um, and then talk is, that, is, the, is the scheduling reservation software that... Um, Oh man! Well, you know the story. You know it much better than I do. Um, you know the Kubershock um, winery and restaurant started in 2005 outside of Chicago as an idea. No vineyards, no winery. Mm -hmm. But hey, people in the Midwest, you know, they want a, kind of a wine experience. How do we do that? Well, they, they've now grown to 750,000 wine club members. Wow. They're one of the top 25 wine producers in the nation. How did they do that? Well, you ask the founder, and they say, you know, we finally decided to write our own software. <laughs> so maybe what you had, I, we've got a place for you to live. Um, we, we, we can feed you, we can, <laughs> I mean, there's tons of wine here. Yeah. 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 Well, there's probably, I'm telling you, there's a great, great need in our industry to get this right. And I actually think that, that the thing that our industry needs is innovation. Mm -hmm. We need innovation at the level that Starbucks can afford. And if we can figure out how to be as effective with technology as an organization of that size as small players but working as a group right uh, we won't be bemoaning you know sober October right I, I agree the, the digital hospitality experience it needs to be stepped up so much right you just get a generic email or a generic text thank you for you know, making your reservation. Oh, here's a reminder. But like, where is the story? Where is the connection between the customer and the winery before they even get here on exactly. property? This is, and we've known this for a long time, big data. We've known we needed this. Um, the industry's known we need this. A lot of us are just, the problem is we just don't have the, the wherewithal, the scale to invest at that level. If we could get uh, help from the, you know, our, um, our public partners, you know, from our development agencies, and and help and have their help, you know, underwriting it. It's kind of like building a new highway. Right. If we can build a new highway for our consumers, um, we can greatly uh, serve, you know, better serve them. Um, and and we've advocated this for a long time. Um, I actually believe that this is the future. So now how did Willamette Valley Vineyards solve this problem in part? 
Well, we did it in another way. What we did was we went out and found wine enthusiasts who wanted to participate as owners in a winery. Mm -hmm. And we now have 26,000 wine consumers who are owners. And so it's like a, a wine club on steroids. Mm -hmm. So now we have a relationship with those owners. And so we know more about them and they have a connection to us. Right. There's other ways of creating the connection, which you described, mm -hmm. learning the interests and needs, the wishes, desires, the, the dislikes, right? Um, and the timing of a customer and that information will enable you to deliver what they are most interested in. Right. But what we, we basically uh, kind of done a Flintstone method of that very thing. Um, and that is what's fueled our success. Yeah, it's been amazing to see. Yeah, it's yeah. it's um, it's a you know the the our form of capitalism in in uh, in the modern world is deeply flawed, and um, because it's um, ruled by capitalists, <laughs> and and um, what will allow us to get the benefits of um, the philosophy of capitalism is to put ownership, break it up into small pieces and put it in the hands of the community. Mm -hmm. When the community owns the provision of goods and services to the public, you're going to get conduct that is going to respect the community. Right. You're going to get stewardship. You're going to get support for societal needs. You're going to get respect um, uh, to all people, uh, mm -hmm. regardless of you know whatever background they may have or whatever uh, lifestyle they may have. Right. Um, and and so that was really what was dri driven me to do this is that um, there are a lot of wine enthusiasts that will never have the means to plant their own vineyard or make their own build their own winery. Correct. But we can do it together. Very much so. And that's what we've done at Willamette Valley Vineyards. We're doing it together. Yes. Yes, you are. And it's, ugh, I love it. I do. I, I, you know, I did all the backstories. I wasn't going to talk about all the boring stuff of like all the legislation and everything that you went through to make all that happen. But I mean, just diving into that, that was, that was fun. Yeah, it's, it's um, now, according to President Obama, signed the Jobs Act which uh, formalized um, this form of uh, crowdfunding or community-based funding right. that allows un what they call an unqualified investor mm -hmm. to make a, a certain amount of investments with their resources. Right. Um, yeah, this paternalism that was implemented um, to control the investments that people could make in this country only serve the wealthy. And look what it's led to. The, the people who, and the ethnic groups that followed the Great Depression have been essentially locked out of participating in the capitalistic system because the laws prevented them from raising money from each other. Right. And um, that created an incredible wealth divide in our country. It, uh, and I would say it wasn't, it was well intended, right? They wanted to protect people from, you know, promoters and... Right, and, right? But, and losing everything that they had as well, yeah, yeah. right? But they could have established some limits. Right. We were the very first company in the United States to be successful using a provision of the federal law called Regulation A. And at the time allowed a limit of $1.5 million to be raised by uh, what they regarded as non-qualified investors. Right. So here's the threshold. You're a non-qualified investor if you make less than $250,000 a year. This was in the mid-1980s. Right. And you owned less than $2 million in assets, excluding your home, furnishings, and automobile. Correct. Which means only people that you and I have never met are the only ones that could buy stock right. in growing companies. Right. 
So the wealth, wealthy got wealthier and the poor ended up, and the middle class ended up working for them. Exactly. And, and we got an economy um, and a political system that was reflective of that, of which we still are living in. Um, so I'm hoping that, um, that um, and, and the SEC, unfortunately, has not followed through on implementing President Obama's legislation. They've done a little bit of it. They cracked the door open a little bit. They still make entrepreneurs have to go through these uh, funder type organizations mm -hmm. rather than, but you still can do it direct like we did. It's just hard. Yeah. Um, but now we, we really figured this out because now we're NASDAQ listed. So now we're, we're playing with the big dogs. Even right. though we're a tiny little company, we're NASDAQ listed. Right. Now, the way this works is if you're NASDAQ listed, you don't have to blue sky your offerings. You don't have to register with each state to offer securities mm -hmm. if you're NASDAQ listed. So if you can afford to be, you know, pay the dues of being with the, the big dogs, right. you're not subject to all of these costs of doing an offering. So when we go out to raise capital, selling our preferred stock, we fell out of form and sent it into the SEC. There you go. Makes, it helps when you know the, the rules of, and regulations. We're the only company, uh, crowd-funded or community-funded company, that has a NASDAQ listing. Which means that we have a big, bright blue ocean out in front of us <laughs> to sail into. And that brings me to a quote that you have said many, many times over the years. We're just getting started. You know, our shareholders a couple uh, annual meetings ago authorized an increase in the preferred stock from 10 million shares to 100 million shares. Holy cow. There is a half a billion dollars of authorized capital in our treasury. Now, the only way we can unlock that is to responsibly operate a profitable business, mm -hmm. keep our word with our investors, um, and um, provide them with a delightful experience that other people will want to have as well. Exactly. And of course, having a great bottle of wine to share at Thanksgiving. Exactly. Yes. And to tell your friends about it. Yeah. I've got a couple uh, rapid fire questions. I'll reveal the wine and I'll get you out of here. Uh, favorite artist to listen to during harvest? Oh boy. Hmm. You know, I love Rascal Flats. Okay, there we go. I really like Taylor Swift going to the Chiefs game, so. That's, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Your favorite indulgent food? Anqua Dairy Rocky Road ice cream. Oh, we're speaking the same language there. They make the best. Yes. Rocky Road ice cream in the world. Yes. And I'm, let me tell you, on my, on my grave, well, there won't be one, but if there was, mm -hmm. it would be ice cream connoisseur. Perfect. If you could choose a superpower, what would it be? Patience. Yeah. Harvest notes. I would assume that they're digital here, but the question is, are they digital or handwritten? Both. Okay. But we, well, we, you know, the, um, but yeah, here you have a short question, but let me tell you, um, we've endured some hard lessons here. Right. Um, we had a great winemaker here by a fellow named Joe Ibrahim who left to get into the distilling business because his wife was pregnant. She was going to deliver in October. Mm. And he, along with all of our winemakers of the past, including Joe Dobbs, kept extremely good records and protocols on all of these wines. Right. We hired um, a new winemaker um, 
out of Napa, I mean out of Sonoma, um, that didn't seem to be interested in those. And in the 2021 vintage, um, we had serious problems. And I can tell you that um, I'm very, very fortunate to have had the friendship and the support of Bill Fuller, mm -hmm. of Joe Dobbs, of uh, Joe Ibrahim, of Terry Colton, of Joe Wright, of uh, Nicholas Key, um, all who came back to help us figure this out. That's and they beautiful. did. We figured it out. But let me tell you, it was the most challenging um, experience this company's ever had, and, and I have ever had. Wow. And the, and the lesson, um, still living with it, I have tinnitus now because of the stress related to it. Mm. But um, we, we did endure. Terry decided to stay uh, um, after the rescue. Right. Came back from California. Um, but you know, it's, it's not everything is perfect. No. And I think that, you know, you look at all the lessons I've learned in life. One of them is um, being careful about putting people in positions of leadership that aren't prepared for it. And it took me 71 years old to figure that out. <laughs> well, hopefully somebody else hears that and yeah. takes that advice. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, the last book you read. It could be on Audible or it could even be like a podcast or something. Oh, The Long Walk to Freedom. Okay. I, my wife's um, dream was to go to South Africa for most of her life. And we finally got the time to go. That's awesome. And um, I read the book from cover to cover in South Africa. Wow. And tried to take in as much of that I could that was the, the kind of the touch points, you know, the, the geography of, that's in the book. Wow. That would be amazing. Yeah, Nelson Mandela is a, um, man, what an amazing human being. Yeah. Couldn't, can't say enough. Yeah, we, we, need, we need that leadership now. Yeah. I totally agree. Yeah. Well, are you ready for me to reveal the blind wine? Oh, yes, please. Okay. So. Yeah, I feel like we should be sharing. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, we'll share. We'll, we'll share. share. Mm. So this is a 2014 Elton Pinot Noir from Isabel Mounet. Yeah. The better half of Andrew Davis. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I know where these grapes come from. Yeah, no, I thought it was they a great... They come from the century block. Yeah, I thought it was a great connection. Yeah, yeah, yeah this is delicious. You know, uh, during this time she made this wine, she was helping us here as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the... Yeah. Um, um, those vines are closely spaced... They're southeast facing. They're a little bit higher elevation at, at Elton. And they're called, it's called the century block because they planted it at the new century. Oh, nice. Year 2000. That is amazing. Yeah. And that block is what Chris Viggins has insisted on getting fruit from. <laughs> and so, <laughs> so um, we've, you know, the, um, the well, there's some saying that's like, um, you know, it's the. You know, if you want to, if you want to find a great wine, look for the footprints of the great winemakers. Yeah. And we have them in our vineyard. Very much so. Yeah. Very much. Well, Jim, I can't thank you enough for taking the time today. This has been an absolute pleasure. Well, the minute you clap your hands, I would definitely like to learn more about how you can help us figure out our technology. Gladly. Gladly. Thank you for joining me on this flavorful voyage through the world of wine on the Wine Notes Podcast. I've been your host and guide, AJ Winesettle, and it's been an absolute pleasure sharing these captivating stories with you. 
But alas, like the last sip of a fine vintage, our time together must end. But don't fret, my wine-loving friend. The cellar doors of the Wine Notes podcast will always remain open, waiting for you to return and explore new conversations, stories, and musings from the captivating people behind the magical world of wine. Before you go, hit that subscribe button on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify, and don't forget to leave a sparkling five-star review to help spread the word. Until our glasses clink again, remember to savor life's moments and let the spirit of wine and camaraderie linger on your palate. Cheers, and as always, may your wine glass be full, your heart be light, and your journey be delightful.